finding our way as people of faith isn't easy. Signs of God's presence guide the journey of the faithful. Cherished symbols of our faith are passed down through the ages. By these symbols, we know one another. With these symbols, we mark the presence of the living God. Praise be to God who lives and moves among us. God, we watch and wait for you. In the darkness, we strain our eyes to see your light and our ears to hear your voice. Your guidance reassures and strengthens us. As a community of believers, together we search for you and celebrate your obvious and clear presence in our midst. Soothe our minds and bodies, slow our frenzied pace, so we might discover your plans for us. Use our lives as a sign of your presence and love for this world. Amen. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. That's because he isn't the shepherd. The sheep aren't really his. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He's only a hired hand, and the sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I give up my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pen. 
I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Our signs and symbols tell the story of who we are and represent our belief. They give us connection and expression. We express the power of our faith using symbols that bear witness in Christian culture through the ages. Everything that is belongs to God. So any symbol that holds meaning for God's people is fair game for becoming a meaningful sign of our faith. We have our place in this, and there is an urgency to our message. The truth we inherit is plain for us to see. God is with us. We explore more of who we are in this series. These signs and symbols are a part of our faith. They are a visual language that increases the vocabulary of our faith because God cannot be expressed in human language. They cross time and culture. Why do we love those Indiana Jones movies? Because our hero is on a frenzied search for pieces of a puzzle that will reveal what is true, and that truth will change everything. Welcome to week two of our Signs and Symbols series. Last week when we started, we talked in pretty general terms about the signs and symbols of our faith, and this week we begin to get a little more specific. So, for today, our symbols are the shepherd and the lamb. And these are pretty typical symbols, right? Almost as common as crosses and nativities. There are many, many, many examples from the earliest days of the church of shepherd images all over Christian holy places, all over ancient Roman ruins. In fact, it is the most prevalent image used to represent Jesus in the early history of the church. And that's a key idea there. These are not meant to be portraits of Jesus. They are symbolic representations. Like the image in our collage of symbols that we're using for this series, the shepherd with a lamb across his shoulders, but sometimes he has a harp, I guess, to sing songs to the sheep. Sometimes he's shown with a milk jug, standing among them, keeping watch. But this shepherd doesn't usually have long robes and no long beard or long hair even. He looks kind of like a kid. It's a very interesting and maybe a little bit different image than a lot of later ones that come to mind. So let's jump back in time to the second and third century. The church at this point has moved from being a small community of friends and like-minded believers in Jerusalem to cities all over the Mediterranean world, the Arab world, Egypt, and it's not the official religion of the Roman Empire until a little bit later. That's something that Emperor Constantine set in motion, and whether that was either out of his deep personal faith convictions or political expediency, it's hard to say. Historians look at it both ways. Constantine and the history of the early church are not actually the topic of today's message, but they're from this time period and they are fascinating topics to study. But among early Christians in the Roman world, art is so important. Images on your wall painted there on the wall of your house, that would be a sign of wealth. Images in places where Christians gathered to worship would teach the story of faith. They're the painted and carved versions of Sunday school leaflets back in ancient times, and you'd have to be of a certain age to understand that reference, I know. 
So what images do they use in the earliest days of the church? Well, they use the ones that make sense, they use the ones that resonate with them, and they use the ones that won't cause a fuss among their neighbors when they see the pictures. So it becomes kind of a veiled reference, like if you know, you know. If you don't know, then it's a nice picture of a shepherd boy, just an ordinary person. So you could be a little bit sneaky with it if you lived in a place where being a Christian wasn't the popular choice. And so in that case, if someone sees one of these images, they'd say, well, that might be the god Hermes or Orpheus from Greek and Roman pagan mythology. But if you know the secret, it's really Jesus. And because at many points in time they're not the dominant religion in their society or community, these images do tend to have that dual purpose, to be nice pictures in general, but also for those who understand all of the meaning, they become a powerful symbol of faith in Jesus. It's important to remember that many of the earliest Christians were from Jewish backgrounds, and even if they weren't Jewish originally, they would be very aware of the Hebrew scriptures because the Greek version of the Old Testament was a huge international bestseller in those days. Really, I'm actually kind of serious saying that. Certainly the printing press had yet to be invented, of course, but the Septuagint, as it was called, was a very interesting book to literate Jewish and Christian people in the Roman world because it contained all the scriptures collected in one place. Remember, the New Testament wasn't finalized in these times quite yet. There were the Gospels, yes. There were the letters of Paul. There were some other writings and Revelation. But there were also dozens and dozens and dozens of other things and extra Gospels and extra Revelations. Everything that's currently in our New Testament was already regarded as being on the official list of good books to read about Jesus. But there were lots of other books that were matters of debate. And many of the early church leaders disagreed with each other about which ones were important and valuable. So for a few hundred years yet, there still wasn't an official New Testament. But back to the Old Testament, though. In the Ten Commandments, right after number one, you shall have no other gods, is number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And there it is. Probably why the Good Shepherd is the most common early symbol of Jesus. Because you want to show and tell about Jesus without showing Jesus. Does that make sense? It literally would not have been kosher to make a portrait of Jesus trying to physically represent him, at least not any kind of actual representation of Jesus, because that would bump up against the second commandment. It would be like making an idol and worshiping that picture or statue instead of Jesus himself. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, this was a big debate in the church, whether pictures were okay to be actual pictures of Jesus, and if so, were people in danger of worshiping the picture and not God? Fast forward several hundred years, and by then, and actually now too, people are quite happy to make physical representations of what they think Jesus, Mary, and other biblical characters actually look like. Take a look at any cathedral or children's Bible and you will see that we no longer have this concern about worrying about a picture of Jesus might distract us from worshiping the real Jesus. So the shepherd was used in these times as a great choice to communicate Jesus the idea of Jesus, in the earliest days of the church. And because it's not meant to actually be a picture of the actual Jesus person, it's not an idol, it's an idea. It's not a graven image, it's a general statement. It's a representation in human form of who Jesus said he was, the good shepherd. And when Jesus himself said it, it was a symbol, it was a metaphor, and it's one with a very long history in our faith. When archeologists find ancient ruins of houses of worship, 
sometimes they find the same picture, a shepherd. And if it's in an ancient synagogue, then the image of the shepherd probably means it's David. If it's an ancient church that they're finding the ruins of, it's probably the good shepherd and meant to represent Jesus. But sometimes they're not sure what kind of building they're uncovering because they find these same pictures. Few images have such a rich biblical pedigree, both in the Old and New Testaments, Mike Aquilina writes in his book, Signs and Symbols. Shepherd is a common metaphor for God and for the king of Israel. In Genesis, Jacob calls God the shepherd, the rock of Israel. And remember, the great King David was himself a humble shepherd boy when he received his anointing to become king. And as son of God and descendant of David, Jesus, therefore, has a dual claim to the title of shepherd, and he applied it to himself throughout the Gospels. Early Christians, remember, they were big fans of the Greek language Old Testament because the King James Bible would not be invented for another 1,200 years. And they read things like Psalm 23 through the lens of Jesus and the church. So when they heard the, the words, the Lord is my shepherd, they would think Jesus. When they hear the house of the Lord in Psalm 23, they interpret it as the church as green pastures, um, still waters, and table, and oil mentioned in the psalm were understood to be the sacraments. In fact, the earliest art decorating baptismal fonts in churches were decorated with the shepherd image, recalling Psalm 23 and those images which early Christians took to mean pointing to the Christian understanding of faith and baptism and initiation, um, and so kind of combining it all together. Also interestingly, the image of the shepherd appears in Christian catacombs because who else but the good shepherd would you want to collect you up into his flock and lead you into the afterlife? And even though all these shepherd images aren't supposed to depict the historical person of Jesus, they do tell us about what the savior of the world is like. We see him in these images looking like a boy, a youth, a, a, a beardless, short-haired young man, but he exudes strength, joy, eternal youth. This young herdsman represents an approachable savior because he is not mighty in any worldly way. He doesn't wear any fancy clothes and he doesn't really have any special social standing. He's just a humble shepherd. That's the kind of Lord and Savior we want to follow. One who is down to earth, so to speak, and also for real. Someone who lived our life and knows what life is like for ordinary people on this earth. So of course, all this talk about Jesus being the shepherd means that the flock of sheep must be us, his followers, the believers. At the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus tells Peter to act, to um, look after his sheep, since Jesus won't be able to be doing it in person anymore. And so, of course, that means the flock, us, the believers, the followers, we are the sheep. I think there's a camp song to that effect that kids like to sing about, I want to be a sheep. Well, that's the story. And if it's true, if he's the shepherd, then we're the sheep. There's also another understanding of the lamb in these images because there's also a tradition that the lamb is Jesus too. Whenever there's an image of a lamb on its own without a shepherd, that's another image to represent Jesus. In ancient Jewish tradition, of course, lambs were given in sacrifice in the temple, in Exodus, in the days of the temple in Jerusalem. And even when John the Baptist sees Jesus approaching, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. What a curious kind of symbolism. Jesus is the shepherd and the lamb. 
Jesus is the Lord and the sacrifice. In Revelation, at the very end of the biblical story, the lamb is described as slain and victorious, bleeding and on the throne triumphantly at the same time. It is a paradox for sure. Once again, we have these signs and symbols of our faith to teach us, to reassure us, to invite us to ponder the mysteries of God. They are not just decorations for churches, and they're not just a secret code either, where if you line them up and translate them correctly, you will find the location of a lost treasure or a secret truth that has been suppressed for centuries. As cool as it seems to read the story and watch it on the screen, Things like the Da Vinci Code aren't what we're talking about when we try to spend some time unpacking these biblical signs and symbols. These signs and symbols are a visual language and one that is meant to give us greater depths of understanding and faith when we use this language. We inherit these signs and symbols. We cherish them. We remember and employ them because, as our theme verse for this series says, God is always making it possible to see God. Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through the things God has made. God shows us that a good shepherd will lead us through life and home to God too. Amen.
hope you're enjoying Pod Church. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and be notified each time there's a new video. Be sure to check out our Facebook page for up-to-date information as well as our weekly newsletter. Feel free to say hello on Facebook Messenger or use our email address and let us know how you're enjoying Pod Church. Go in peace. Go into your new week following the Good Shepherd who will watch over you, guide your steps, and make sure that he is always close by as well. Amen. Pod Church is the weekly online worship of Marquette Hope, a United Methodist faith community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Find us at facebook.com slash mqthope, mqthope.com, and on YouTube.